Illinois stocks continued a great rally really over the last two weeks uh, and extended that rally again today. We're seeing um, some really good signs. So I'm going to break down the good signs that we saw today that have been kind of adding to what we've seen over the past week uh, to really signal that, that we might be getting at least a short run, intermediate run here at the very least. Uh, especially considering the seasonality. I'm going to show you that here as, as well as to what we may expect uh, in the month of April going into that really early May uh, FOMC meeting. So things have changed in the bond market too. A really significant change in the yield spread. We'll talk about that. Uh, not as much of a move in small in the Russell 2000. We'll, we'll talk about that divergence uh, that we see between you know these large cap growth areas and the small cap stocks that had been doing so well. There's also been a huge divergence in the large mega cap names and, and long term bonds. They've been moving kind of hand in hand until the last two weeks. So we'll look at that divergence and see what's going on there. Uh, we'll take a look at what sectors have been really driving uh, the strength and the weakness and, and the outliers in either direction. And then our trade idea is a stock that's kind of a bellwether that if the markets are going to be bullish, this one's going to help lead the way. So we'll talk about how to trade that one going into April. So let's go ahead and get started. Today is Monday, March the 28th, 2022. This is the market outlook from marketscholars.com. My name is David Settle. All right, well, let's start off taking a look at the S&P 500 with the market forecast indicator. And look at this break. So today, uh, following uh, Friday's cluster, overbought cluster, uh, with a good, strong break into the above 80 on the um, intermediate line, good, strong near-term rally, again, well above 2.5%. So we've broken through there. Uh, dark green shading and green line, we've broken above the 62% retracement level. I mean, that's not like, again, getting above 78 is what reverses the impulse moves to the upside. Um, but still, that's that's a good breakout. I mean, 62% is a resistance. So that is a resistance level. And so it puts uh, f that that 78% well into play, right? Very good likelihood we, we will, if we can hold this breakout, we'll get through there. So very, very good sign. Uh, very good move on the S&P 500 today. The NASDAQ, not quite breaking above. It's 62%, but you can see over 6.5% above its moving average. Above the 50% line at least, dark green shading in the green line. Intermediate lines above 80, so it's made that run up. The Russell 2000, the intermediate line was already above 80. Uh, this one's lagging behind a little bit. It can't quite get out of this little range from last week. It's still actually below its 38% retracement in that 23% line. See, the NASDAQ actually did get back above that 23% line. And the S&P, if you recall, never actually dropped below it. Only a couple of times um, before coming well up above it. So, so I mean, this like the the it's a good good strong move this week in all these major indexes. Um, so good opportunity now um, that we can be bullish here, especially heading into if you take a look at the seasonality um, for the S&P 500. Um, oops, no, I don't want to delete that. I wanted to load it. So seasonality. Uh, we are heading into a seasonally bullish time of the year, heading into the beginning of May, um, where we tend to be pr relatively bullish uh, here in the month, the, the end of March, uh, which would be March 23rd uh, last week, into now uh, what would ultimately be peaking on the 2nd of May uh, of this year. Uh, that's the, that's the, the seasonal trend that we have going on. And we're still down for the year, year to date. Now, at this time of year, on what is this today, April the 28th, we're typically right about here, which is we're just barely about break even for the year to date. So we're, we're lagging behind from that perspective, but you can see uh, we have some potential to catch up pretty quickly. We're typically up on average about three and a quarter percent by the end of the month of April. So we have a good opportunity here for a good strong month uh, to the upside uh, to come out of this. Let's take a look at the long-term chart. Again, great candle so far this week. It's only one day, but the great candle last week and so far this week. And as of right now, we are the Hakanyashi closes above that high point as of right now. The high is at 45.46. The Hakanyashi closes 45.52. Uh, so, so as long as we can finish strong this week, that's going to continue to be the case. You can see the PPO is really low, so there's opportunity for it to rally again. Uh, when you take a look at the three green arrow charts, we had a whole week of green shading. So very good sign. Remember last week we said 
We need that the whole. By the end of the week, we need it to stay green shading the whole way, and it did. Now, the MACD histogram is rolling over, but that's okay, right? We might get a red arrow on the MACD, uh, we might, but, but we might not ever get three red arrows again. At least not for a while, right, as we, as we potentially start a new intermediate rally here. So very good sign from that perspective. Uh, if you take a look at the this chart, you can see easily above the 200-day moving average, the 8 and the 17 day are about to cross above the 200 themselves. And thus, barring any like dramatic fall this week, they're by, probably by the end of the week, your 8 day is going to cross because your 8 day is about to cross already. Um, so if we zoom in, your 8 day is, just, is probably crossed today already. Uh, and then your 17 day, again, is moving up pretty rapidly. By the end of the week, barring a significant drop, even if we just kind of stay around here, um, you're going to get a pretty good rally in that 17 day. They're both above the 50 now, so now you expect that they'll both get above the 200, which would be, again, a good sign for reversal uh, on the S&P. Not quite the case on the Qs. We're still below the 200 day moving average. We're still below that 62% retracement. So there still is, and we're still below the top of this big volume node, which happens to be below the 200. So breaking above this 62% would be a huge feat for the NASDAQ, but it would be trend changing right we can see how bullish that would be if we actually did get that the russell 2000 is a little different right it's not anywhere close to the 200 it's still below its value area see the q's uh if you notice um is well inside of, it's above the point of control for the year and well inside the value area it's in fact closer to the top of the value area than the bottom the s p 500 is really close to the top of the value area well above the point of control IWM is a different story. It's below the entire value area, and it's well below the point of control, which is still above the 200-day moving average. So the 8 and 17, and now the 30 look like they're about to cross the 50 because we've been consolidating for so long, but we're not quite breaking out yet, even just to fill in the gap, the rest of this gap between the 50 and the 200-day moving averages. Let me quickly show you how we're looking on the week. Um, because the 17 week has been acting as resistance and still is for the IWM. On the Qs, um, 17 week ended up, we ended up closing above the 17 and kind of came back to the 50. And so far, one day into this week, we're above that 50 week moving average. So, really important that we stay above the 50 week because remember, the correction starts when you break below it and obviously would end when you get back up above it. Remember, SP, um, it was only below it for a few weeks. Uh, and then we rallied, and we're already back up above the 30 week now. So we're back above all these weekly moving averages. And really, and you can see the MACD green arrow, like things are really turning around for the S&P 500. As I said, for IWM, not the not that's not the case. The MACD has already had a his positive histogram, but we're not above the 17 week moving average. So it's it's really lagging and really struggling. And and again, would suggest that maybe you know this is kind of a, a niche rally right now in, a, in, a, in the growth area of the markets that had just that just had been the most oversold um, and they're bouncing up right now. We'll take a look at more of that in here later when we take a look at the different asset classes. Let's take a look at some of these other oscillating charts. So big move above 25 now on the DMI positive and below 20 on the negative. So very good move there. That's the breakout side. Now we're not above 30. That's really the breakout when you get above 30, but at least we're above 25, and that's a good sign. See, getting above 30, getting above 25, and then 30 really is a breakout. Uh, so that's kind of the ideal. We're we're almost there. Uh, we are we got the same above 25, below 20 on the uh, Qs and the IWM, um, not going anywhere. Right now, you see we've IWM did get above 25 and below 20. Now we were just barely above the 30-day moving average, so it's a different story on the Qs and the S&P. But you can see, like, just getting that that signal isn't the bet, isn't the end all be all. That's why we'd like to get above 30 to really solidify the breakout. But at least getting above 25 and getting below 20 uh, is a good sign. At least, I mean, that's a good strong run. The RSI is also showing positive developments above 60 now. Um, it's similar to that, you know, we got above 60 just barely there. Uh, we're just barely above 100 though, so we're not. It's not really a, a you know strong breakout. Same thing with the Qs. We're above 60. Uh, we're above 100, but we're not. We never, never really did get a good solid break above like 150. Um, and then, of course, uh, I've shown you that the Bollinger Bands. You know, again, we're in the upper quartile, but because we're so far away from the upper band and the bandwidth is already so high, 
You know, it's kind of hard to start a new trend from a bandwidth that's already so high. Much easier to start it when the bandwidth is really low and you're breaking above, you know, or below um, the upper or lower band. See here, you're nowhere near breaking in the upper band. The Qs also are nowhere near breaking the upper band because the bandwidth is already very high. And IWM, you notice, um, it's not even in the upper quartile anymore. Uh, so, so if there's anything that would suggest that it's going to be hard to start a new trend, as bullish as all these signals are, is you know, is there anything that would suggest that this is that we've had just a really good out outsized short term move and not necessarily the beginnings of an intermediate move? This would be what would suggest that the fact that we the bandwidth is already so high on these indexes and we're, we've been unable to actually breach the bandwidth because it's been so high. And usually you start new trends by breaching either the lower bandwidth when you're starting a bearish trend or the upper bandwidth when you're starting a bullish move uh, from a low from a bandwidth. So so what ultimately might be the case is we might we might. You know, again, a very outsized short-term move within the scope of a of an outsized bandwidth already, and then now this kind of consolidating until the bandwidth comes back down to a more trend-ready state, uh, right? You see the Ichimoku cloud. You know, we are above 65, we are above two, so we do have an intermediate trend strength above the cloud too on the S&P. Great sign. The Q is not quite through there. Not quite those same levels yet, still kind of lagging behind there. And then IWM is nowhere close, right? We are in the cloud, but not getting through it. Um, we are, and remember the cues that break out above the 62 is so significant. There's another reason why it'd be so significant, because we'd be breaking through the cloud uh, in that case. And then IWM, you can see just, I mean, getting above 38 would be a big deal uh, for multiple reasons. And that would be another one too, getting above the cloud. And starting any kind of trend, we just have not had any kind of trend on the on IWM. And like I said, that's brought the the bandwidth is actually still relatively high compared to where it's been in the past. Uh, so there, even though we haven't really been pushing to a strong bandwidth, there's still potential for consolidation there uh, as well uh, in that particular indicator. Let's take a look at the intraday chart here, and we can see uh, from an intraday level. Um, the higher high, higher low, and that last push at the end of the day got us up to new highs on the S&Ps and the Qs, but not on IWM. At least it got us closer to yesterday's or Friday's high. It got us above Friday's low, whereas earlier in the day we were actually below that, and earlier in the day we were starting to fill in that gap. Uh, so so you know, we were threatening last week's low point, which is going to be a little bit of a support for IWM. So at least we don't have that. Right, and... And I mentioned to you before, uh, one of the indicators we've been kind of watching uh, now that we're potentially starting this new bullish run is you know, the stochastics and getting the average, the 20-day average up above 60 and, and really starting a bullish run. We are almost there. We've been so bullish for so long on the S&P and the NASDAQ that we're almost there on those. The Russell, uh, we are we're already above 60, um, but you can see starting to kind of peter out there. So... You know, again, we'll see what happens with where we're closing relative to the 20-day range, and then ultimately what ends up happening uh, with the rune indicator, right? Because uh, this tells us, you know, whether we continue to push up to new highs or not. And the Russell's already come. The the positive line's coming down below 78. Uh, the S&P is still up there. The Nasdaq's still up there, um, but you see their negative lines aren't down far enough yet um, to suggest again a sustained trend yet. So really, really good signs. Uh, really good. You know, last week was a great week. Uh, we held. We didn't necessarily main, um, extend, but at least we held and maintained and extended a little bit of, of the prior week's kind of strong bullish moves. And then so far today, uh, it's kind of good. Some good breakout signals. Um, and so, so the and and the other thing too. And I didn't show you this chart yet. Uh, let's take a look quickly at the volume. And the trading range for today, the volume was really light, 68 million. The trading range well below average, 5.85. So let me put those numbers in context. 5, 68 million is way down here, and 5.85 is also way down here. So very small numbers. Um, you know, again, being below moving averages, we don't quite want them to be that small yet. But you know, we take what we get there. And then the other thing too that's kind of standing out is volatility is already 
near extreme lows. Like we dropped below 20. Now the last time we dipped below 20, the last time we dipped below 20, just barely by the end of the day, um, you don't really see that there, um, but we closed at what, 1990, 1997 we got to at the end of that day. Uh, we rallied off of that. So here we are in 1957 with an even more extreme low now on a relative basis than what we had back then. And you also see, like for an example, the skew is still relatively high. Not as high as it's been, but remember this is a high level, relatively speaking, to where it's been in the past, right? Uh, so you know, the, here at 140 in the past has been you know, high level. So for skew to be so high and for the VIX to be so low relative to the VIX 3M, again, you know, shows that there's not a lot of worry right now in the short term uh, where the markets are at now, which is crazy, uh, but there's just not a lot of concern uh, about the markets in the short term for a good reason. But there still is a pretty decent level of concern, you know, in the bigger picture, in the longer term, as we see with the SKU and with the VIX 3M, which is holding a lot more of its value. Um, you know, we, you know, if this were gradually moving lower, that would be a different story. But the fact that it's spike down so low so quickly um you know and gets and it's already down to extremes opens you up for a bounce off of those extremes uh in volatility so definitely something to keep an eye on but again great bullish signs um breakout signs you know there there are a lot there's a lot of there's a lot more bullish signs than there are um like questionable signs uh again the only thing is that bandwidth, the Bollinger Band with the volatility is already so high and so big that it, that it opens up bigger short-term moves because of how big it already was. Um, so it's not like we are breaking out of a consolidation, right? We're not breaking out of a short-term range. That's the only concern about the viability of, uh, of a lengthy intermediate run versus, say, kind of a short intermediate run that lasts you know, on the smaller end of the scale, like a month, um, which would be a month starting because we just barely started. So it'd be a, it'd be pretty much the month of April, which seasonally is a strong time of year. So that's kind of the direction I'm leaning right now, that any strength we may get may be limited to this month. And let's take advantage of with what we get while we got it. Um, so what do you think? Do you agree with that? Do you disagree? Uh, let me know in the comments section below, especially if you disagree. Let me know what what um, charts or indicators are you looking at that would suggest why you're either a lot more bullish than I am or why you might be a lot more bearish than I am. Post those in the comment section down below. Before we look at some other charts, I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Mouse over this icon here in the bottom right corner of your screen. Hit the red subscribe button that pops out. There's also one down below the video if you're watching us on YouTube. That notifies you when our videos are posted. Also, while you're down there, hit that thumbs up icon. That tells us two things. You liked our video today. You want us to do another video again tomorrow. Quick way to give us feedback if you like our stuff. Of course, if you don't like it, you don't have to click on anything. You don't even have to watch if you don't want to. Also, while you're down there, comments. What did you get out of the video today? What stood out to you? What questions or comments do you have about what I brought up? Post those in the comments section. Join our website at marketscholars.com. There's a link popping out up there in the top right corner of your screen. Click on that link to subscribe to our site for free. Follow me on Twitter for more content between the videos from day to day. There's my handle, at DavidSettle42. And join our Market Outlook Facebook group that we've created. All right, if you're watching us here on our blog, check out some of these other things on the right. Click on this icon that takes you to our Market Outlook Live video. Let's see, where is that? It's right here. Um, you can. This is right on 3.30 Eastern Time on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I do a quick 10, 15-minute video right here on this page. I take a look at all the trades we've done in prior Market Outlooks. I look at today's trade idea. Uh, we already put it on uh, before the market closed today, the one you'll hear at the end of the video today. So this is where I do that. Um, you can also get to it by clicking on live trade review in our main menu. Uh, you come down here, excuse me, come down here and click on this view more. That's These are our upcoming classes. That takes you to our calendar here. These are upcoming classes for the week and all of our four years worth of recordings going back. Uh, if you come down to the bottom, click on that heart. It looks We got back up to almost 100, 95. Came really, really close to 100 there. Um, but click on that, opens up this tab, and hit that like button. Also, hit this thumbs up icon, it opens up this tab, uh, and click on that like button. Again, the more you do that, it helps get our content out to all of our followers, so we always ask. Uh, it also benefits you because Twitter and Facebook promote content in your timelines from the accounts that you engage with the most. So we try to make it really easy for you to engage with us right here. All right, now let's take a look at what's driving the price action 
and let's look at just today alone here, uh, March 28th. Let's go a couple of minutes. And you can see commodities, big, after a big week last week, big drop today, uh, really giving up a lot of those gains. Gold dropping down to, this wasn't a, a major rally in the dollar, though it was pretty decent, you know, up for most of the day up a third of a percent, which is pretty bit decent sized move for that, um, for the ETF that doesn't move very much. But you can see this was really an outsized move in the queues. The queues really outpacing all equity asset class. Emerging markets did pretty well too, despite the stronger dollar. They lagged behind the equ equities. Developed markets were down. Uh, sm um, small cap stocks were down. Uh, so not everything was up. High yield bonds were up. High, high yield um, bonds and so were uh, long term treasuries were actually up today too. So uh, finally getting a little bit of a breather in um, the in the ten in the long term yield space, the ten year yield down just a smidgen. Uh, the thirty year yield was down more than a percent um, there. In fact, if you take a look um, here at the like the yield curve, um, coming over here to the yield curve, the yield curve broke a significant level. So we have um, the two year Treasury note here. Let's just zoom in on how we're closing today. Uh, about 2.33% is a holding ground up there at these high levels, um, but the, the spread between the two, the two and the 10 year dropping down to below 20. So big, significant break. I uh, remember when we break below tw the, these, the, the yield spread moves is in these tranches of 20 basis points. So breaking below 20 now means that we're that, I mean, we could easily go right down to zero. Like there's no, uh, that's, that's how quickly these things can move. In fact, the five-year and the 30-year are already inverted. Uh, they inverted today for the first time since 2006 when the Fed was done raising rates in 2006. The Fed has just started raising rates. And as we know, the, the odds, in fact, check these odds out here. The odds of getting a 50 basis point hike in May are 70%, right? So 70% chance we're going to get a 50 basis point hike in May. Uh, if you look at the odds for another 50 basis point hike here, in June, you can see we're up to 78% uh, odds that we're going to get another 50 basis point hike in June. Uh, then what's interesting is in July, right? July, we actually have, I mean, it's not 100%, um, but 99, or excuse me, it's a 91% chance that we're going to get at least one. So two, two, and one um, is what uh, we're getting 91% chance of knowing that we already got one. Uh, but then... This was actually up to 70, close to 70% today, earlier today. The fact that we'd get another 50 basis point hike in July. And right now it's at 55, so it's a coin flip, but on the more positive side of the coin flip. So, you know, you can see just how, how, how much these odds are going up. The odds of getting um, 11 high, or excuse me, 9 hikes by the end of the year are up to pretty much 100%. Um, 99.7 for 8 and 93.2 for 9 and then 65% um, I kind of fat fingered that but about 65% chance of getting um, of getting 10 rate hikes um, by the end of the year of course uh, we've already had one two three four five six seven so that would mean at three of these meetings we're getting an extra rate hike Right, because you know, one if there are seven meetings, so we started in March, so there's seven meetings here. Um, so that means you're getting another three. So that's a 65% chance that we're going to get a third 50 basis point hike somewhere in here, most likely going to be July. Uh, again, the odds the odds of a rate hike in November are relatively low because November is a is right before the presidential election. So unless we have a pretty set schedule there. Uh, they don't like to, to do very much or do be too crazy heading into an election season. And you can see that the next Fed meeting actually is at the, at the end of April. So that also opens us up for, um, you know, maybe a potentially a bullish month heading into that meeting. Uh, and then, of course, the Fed will be trying to figure out what to do from there. Of course, it, you know, that I, the question is whether the Fed will actually do this, right? That's... I and mean, there's a lot of people that don't think the Fed will even come close to 10 basis, the 10 rate hikes. You know, maybe four, maybe five, but then that's it. Of course, the bond market's not saying that. The bond market's way up here, about you know, the two and a third percent. Again, 
you can see the futures market is sitting, you know, like I said, at a 90% chance of being at two and a quarter and a pretty decent chance, 65% chance of being two and a half. The two year note um, is, is not quite two and a half yet. And remember the 10 year note, uh, the 30 year note is actually at two and a half. And the 10 year note, 2.57, is less than two and a half. So for the two year note to get up that far, I mean, of course, I mean, we'd be inverting the yield curve uh, really, really quickly. But you, you keep in mind, we're already at 2.33 on the two year. 2.33 is right there. That's where the two year note is relative to where the 10 year note is. That's a dramatic difference compared to where it was previously when there was about 100 some odd basis points difference uh, between the two. So uh, big move uh, in bond markets, um, but nice to see that you know we had a little bit of an up move, especially in um, the longer term bonds here today, coming off of you know what is actually another cluster today uh, for IEF. Uh, so getting plenty of clusters, I mean well below the moving average, uh, would suggest that we'll probably at least you know get a short term bounce here. Um, and and again, if you look at the interesting the patterns come to the comparison chart in the past what we've seen in the past is that the NASDAQ um, has been you know the IEF and the NASDAQ have been kind of moving in conjunction with each other when bonds rally when bond yields move up that puts pressure on these high growth areas and like the NASDAQ when bonds um, yields fall then that allows uh, bond, so when bond prices rise, then that really helps the NASDAQ take off uh, to the upside. And of course, when bonds fall, it puts pressure on, on the Qs. Well, that was the case until right here. right At this point, um, the Qs have taken off like a rocket. Well, on that same day, this is where yield or bonds have gone. Uh, they've actually continued lower. So... You know, again, something is is dramatically off here. Um, that, that's a pretty decent divergence in one direction and the other for something that doesn't really move that much. So somebody's got it wrong, right? Either the stock market, in this case, this growth area, or um, or this, you know, this spot has got it wrong. Now keep in mind, you know, coming from the, you know what the end of last year, January twenty seventh, uh, is when the Nasdaq peaked. So if I were to go over here to asset class comparison chart and go to uh, when did the NASDAQ peak here, it'd be, uh, I'd have to go back a little bit further in three months. So I'd have to go back to right there, just, uh, January 3rd. So December the 27th looks like is when the NASDAQ itself peaked. So let's come over here and do December 27th of last year, uh, going into this March uh, 14th period, March 14th low point, you can see the Qs were just the biggest loser, and it wasn't even close. Like the Qs were down 20%, the S&P was down 11%. They, the, the, these kind of stocks, these growth areas, were just such a big loser in the short term. And commodities were even coming off of their low highs. We're pretty so we're so bullish, and then the dollar and gold um, have done what they've done. But since then, so if you take a look at that chart, since that point, so from March the 15th on to today, uh, it's been the Qs that have just rebounded, and and the dollar and gold and bonds have been down. So you know, in essence, it looks like it's just still just a you know very oversold technical rally. Uh, within a bandwidth, and I've mentioned that before, but within that bandwidth that was big enough to accommodate a big move without breaking through the bands, right? And now, uh, if you look at the Keltner channels along with those bands, uh, you can see we're not even above the Keltner channel yet. And getting above or below the Keltner channel is really kind of a trending thing. And we're not even, we haven't even gotten to, like today's move has actually gotten us to the Keltner channel uh, with a lot of momentum uh, to get up to this about as high as the momentum as we've seen and the bands are outside the Keltner channels but we never did break outside of the band or the channel usually when you kind of get these green arrows you're breaking out of one or the other um, in this case it ended up being the Keltner channels
but you're breaking out of one or the other when you get these green green dots and you break out one way or the other and so far right now we haven't got that so because the bands and the channel was so was wide enough still to accommodate outsized short-term moves uh, like it appears so far uh, that we're getting uh, right now on the NASDAQ but we're, that we're not getting an IWM right where we're finally green the bands have broken out of the Keltners mainly because the Keltners are still contracting we're not really breaking out of either one of those uh, right now and either the the Keltners or the bands and we're not even close to that Let's take a look at how the sectors are performing here. So we'll go to the comparison chart and see how they performed here today alone again. Just today. XLY, discretionary, is your biggest winner. XLK was your next biggest winner, and that was it. Real estate did okay, but very small sector. And you remember financial or materials and energy were your biggest winners last week, but they were such small leadership, um, not surprising to see them come down with the uh, drop in commodity prices. Um, if you look at like their charts here, uh, let's look at XLE on this chart. I mean, they were so, it's been so bullish, and there's a little bit of a divergence going on uh, that you wonder about, you know, the you know the how you know whether or not we're going to start to fill in some of these gaps um, between uh, some of these moving averages in XLE and to a smaller degree in XLB. It's again such a big outsized move in the short term that the MACD histograms already peaked. And you wonder if the MACD itself is about to peak, again, considering how strong the rally has been. So you wonder if, you know, some of those areas which have been so bullish here in the short term the, on this rally is now going to give some of that back, right? If you look at, again, coming off of that, in this case, it would be the January 8th low point uh, for XLB and XLE January or March. Is it, did I say I said January the 8th, but it's really March the 8th. Yeah, March the 8th there. So XLE, uh, its March 8th low point was, it was actually a high point uh, of where it, it, it was. And it's actually a break even uh, from there. But if I go back to that sector grid comparison and take a look at that low point on materials up until now, right, then you can see you know, up until now, it was, you know, materials have been doing really well and financials have been doing well, discretionary technology, communication services, um, all kind of leading the way higher. And there's energy flat, utilities and staples flat, real estate flat. So, again, a little bit of an oversold bounce in some of these areas that have been so bearish, again, going into that March 8th low point. All right, so for our trade idea today, I want to take a look at Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft being one of the uh, bellwethers, uh, especially in those large cap, mega cap tech areas. You can see it finished today with a good rally into the close and a cluster, an overbought cluster, just like the S&P got on Friday, over nearly 6% above the moving average. Uh, when you look at its uh, long-term chart, it's also got some great bullish candles here. Uh, with the close back, the Hakanyashi close easily above the 10 week moving average, rising PPO, positive differential down there. Uh, when you look at the uh, three green arrow chart, let's come over here. Look at the three green arrow chart from Microsoft, getting above the point of control, getting a, clearly above the 200 day moving average. The eight and 17 day moving averages are crossing up above the um, the 50 day moving average, having already crossed the 30. The MACD is rising, the stochastics is bullish, it's moving average is bullish. I mean, very, very good bullish signs. If the markets are bullish, if the markets are turning up, this is what we want it to look like, right? Above 25 on the positive indicator, below 20 on the negative indicator, the RSI and the CCI, now, at least above 100. Not quite, you know, not quite the bullish breakouts that we'd like to see here. Uh, so, so ideally, we get some follow through on that uh, the rest of this week. Uh, the we have a weak bullish trend and inching above the cloud um, on um, the daily chart there, and you like I said, just barely above one and above uh, 50. So you have a weak bullish trend developing. Uh, when you look at its Bollinger Bands, this is again the one thing that's a little bit of hesitant. That the 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 um, bandwidth is already large so we're not breaking out of a smaller bandwidth and starting a new trend um, either breaking out this way or that way um, we're just not getting above 100 now 
Here we never did get above 100. We came close, but we never did get above 100. And when you look at the Keltner channels uh, for those, for that trend, we at least got above the Keltner channel there. And again, we're not we're not above either one of those. We are the Keltners. The bands are breaking out of the Keltners, but we're not breaking out of either one of those yet. So a little bit of a limiting factor uh, on on how bullish we really can be. As a result, um, instead of just going long a call option, I ended up uh, doing a long call vertical spread. And, and instead of buying at the money, I went to one strike price out. Uh, just keep my risk a little bit lower. Um, it's a little bit more aggressive, but at least keeps my, my loss down um, here. There we go. It keeps my loss down there. So let me bring up. Uh, there's our trade. So full position size. Uh, if you take a look at the earnings, comes out after April expiration. So full position size and a, and a pretty decent reward for the risk we're taking. Knowing that if we break back down to 295, uh, then, then we know it's not making the trade uh, the move that we want. And by 290, we've got about a half, 50% loss on that trade. So that's how we're going to set up uh, this bull relatively bullish trade. Not the most bullish, but you know, you know, typically a bull put spread, you're going for for thousand dollars of risk, you're going for about three hundred dollars of reward, three to four hundred. Here we're getting at least eleven hundred, so a little bit more bullish uh, than a than a short put vertical spread, but not as bullish as if we were going for say a long call option uh, and really letting things go. Because again, I'm just a little concerned about the about how likely we are to you know get a really good intermediate run going from here instead of like maybe like a one month or kind of like what we got in the middle of fifteen and sixteen. 2015, 2016. All right, well, that does it for today. You've heard from me now, now I want to hear from you. Use that link popping out in the top right corner of your screen. That takes you to our Market Outlook forums. Open up any new thread with any questions or comments you have. Reply to anybody else's threads. Let's keep this conversation going and in between videos. As always, thank you very much for watching. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that thumbs up icon. Comment on the video down below. Uh, also, remember, you can subscribe to our website at marketscholars.com. Like us on Twitter and Facebook as well. Have a great rest of your Monday night, everybody, and we'll see you all next time.